Part 1. You will hear a telephone conversation between a hotel receptionist and a caller making a reservation. Seconds to look at questions 1 to 7. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Silver Tulip Hotel, good afternoon. How can I help you? Ah, yes. Good afternoon. I'd like to book a room for next Friday. Certainly, sir. How many nights will you be staying? Just one, please. And would you like a single or double room? A double room, please. A double room. And would you like twin beds or a king-sized bed? A king-sized bed, please. Let me see. Yes, we do have a double room available for next Friday. Would you like me to book it for you? Yes, please. Could I have your name, please? Yes, it's Edward Francis. Is that F-R-A-N-C-E-S? No, it's F-R-A-N-C-I-S. F-R-A-N-C-I-S. Yes, that's right. And your home address, please, sir? Yes, it's 23 Cypress Avenue, Cambridge. Is that C-Y-P-R-U-S? No, C-Y-P-R-E-S-S, like the tree. Oh, I see. And your postcode is? CB39NF. And it's just for one night? Yes, that's right. We can reserve a parking space for you. Are you coming by car? Actually, I'll be taking a taxi from the station. That's fine. And one last question. Would you like dinner and breakfast? No dinner, thank you. But I'd like breakfast. Just breakfast. So, to confirm... You're arriving on Friday the 16th of April and leaving on Saturday the 17th. That's one night in a double room with a king-size bed with breakfast. That's right. Thank you very much. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, in the exam you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 8 to 10. And could I have your mobile number, please? Yes, it's 07976 122 577. Oh, uh, no, sorry, it's been changed. It's 07961 121 597. 07961 121 597. Thank you. Is there anything else I can help you with? Yes, I'm having dinner with a friend. Could you recommend a good restaurant nearby? That would be the Winston Churchill. It's about a mile from here. Perfect. Could you please make a reservation for 7pm and leave a message with the details for my friend when he arrives? Certainly. What is the gentleman's name? Mr. Aloi. 
That's A L A O U I. No problem. We look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear the head teacher of an English primary school talking about the school to a group of parents and visitors. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fifteen. Good morning, everyone. And as the head teacher of Cranley Hill Primary School, I'm very happy to welcome you to our open day. Today, the school is open not just to parents of our pupils, but also to anyone else interested in seeing the school. I'll start by telling you about the school, and after that, you can walk round and see it for yourselves. We take most of our pupils from the two nearby villages of Seaborne and Millthorpe. These were once coal mining villages. There have been coal mines here since the 1830s. When the school was originally established, way back in 1899, almost every child's father worked in the mines. However, the coal mines were closed in 1983, and many people left the area as a result. Nowadays, most of the remaining inhabitants tend to commute to work in the city rather than working locally. At present, the number of students on our rolls is just ninety, compared to almost two hundred in 1985, due to the decline in the population of the mining villages. And the staff see this as a big bonus because we know each student personally. The school is very involved in the local community, and we are especially proud of our status as Great Britain's first school to be entirely powered by wind energy. This project began several years ago when it was decided that a wind power turbine should be installed in the school field. This now supplies the school with all the electricity we need, and there is also power left over for the villages nearby. The opposite situation to that in the past, when it was the villages which supplied the school with power in the form of coal from the mines. The project has been of enormous benefit to the school in other ways as well. It has allowed exciting learning opportunities about electricity generation, and the turbine has also inspired poetry, art, and even our own song. It also allows teachers to introduce global issues such as carbon dioxide emissions and global warming to the students. I feel it may be irresponsible to burden young children with worries about global issues which are insoluble, but by actually using wind power as a non-polluting, renewable source of energy instead of using fossil fuels such as oil or gas, we are offering practical solutions to our pupils in their own environment. The school is also extremely involved in other environmental issues. In the last few years, we have developed our school field into what we now call our secret garden, which you will have a chance to explore shortly. Here, the pupils have their own organic vegetable patch, and another special feature of the school is that the vegetables grown here are used in the school kitchens for school lunches, with any extra ones being taken home by the children to share with the community. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty.
Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now I'd just like to tell you some of the things to look out for as you go round the school site. At present, we're standing just at the front entrance to the school facing north, and as you can see, the ground slopes up quite steeply behind the school. To our right, we have the car park, OK? And to our left, we have our sports field. This is just for training and informal games. We use the village football field for our under-11 matches. At the far end of the car park is our recycling centre. This is for things like paper, glass and so on, and everyone is very welcome to make use of it. Immediately behind the school, to the north, we have the play area. Unfortunately, we had to remove the play equipment, the climbing frame and so on, because it didn't conform to safety regulations. But we do have the treehouse in the middle of that area. That's very popular. Then, at the top end of the play area, you'll find the entrance to the secret garden. The vegetable patch is in the bottom corner, and beyond it, hidden in the trees, we have a pond. The children love this because it attracts all sorts of wildlife, frogs, fish and lots of birds. I should just mention the trees. There are over 30 different species, all planted by the children. In the middle of the garden, we have what we call the storyteller's chair, and this is where the children come with their teachers and sit on the grass to listen to stories. And finally, at the top end of the secret garden, to the left, is our wind turbine. And as you go round the classrooms, you'll find lots of work done by the children explaining all about how it works and how proud they are of it. Right, now, before we go... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear part of a lecture about tourism in the leisure industry. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. In today's lecture, we'll begin with an overview of the impact of tourism on the societies and cultures of the host area. Then we'll look at some case studies. One model for the socio-cultural impact of tourism has been provided by Doxy. You'll find a reference in your reading list. He called his model the Iridex. That's a contraction of Irritation Index. And it attempts to show how the attitudes of local people to tourists and tourism change over the years. Doxy identifies four stages. He calls the first stage Euphoria, happiness, because initially the tourists are regarded as a novelty. And because of this, they're welcomed by everyone in the host area. But as well as that, there's another reason for the people in the host community to welcome tourists. Local people realise that tourism brings scope for economic benefits. As tourist development begins to increase, however, local interest in the visitors becomes sectionalised, that means that some sections of the local population become involved with tourists, while others don't. 
and it is increasingly the case that commercial rather than social factors are influencing relationships between tourists and the host community. People are less interested in the tourists for their own sake. Doxy calls this stage apathy. If development continues to increase, apathy may change to annoyance. What's causing this? Well, development of the tourist area may start to spiral up out of control, and this is often accompanied by congestion, which is going to make life difficult for local people. So the policymakers, the government, the local authorities, and so on, provide more infrastructure for the area, more roads, more car parks, and so on. To try to help cope with the influx of tourists, but the lives of the local people are made increasingly difficult, and in the final stage of the model, annoyance has turned to antagonism, and open hostility to the tourists, and now all the detrimental changes to lifestyles in the host area are, fairly or unfairly, seen as due to the tourists. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Well, this sort of pathway is certainly a fairly good reflection of what happens in some tourist destinations, but Doxy's model has drawn a number of criticisms. The most significant is that it suggests a very negative attitude to the socio-cultural effects of tourism. The fact that the model is unidirectional—that it only works in one direction—seems to suggest that decline in the host-visitor relationship is inevitable. Now, in practice, fortunately, things aren't always quite like that. If you look at real situations, you'll see that the relationships between local people and tourists. Are rather more complicated and prone to greater variation than this model suggests, so the model is really rather oversimplified. In fact, studies have highlighted quite a few positive effects of tourism. For example, Doxy's model doesn't look at the effects on the tourists themselves. They may well benefit from increased understanding of the host society and culture. Then. Traditional crafts in the host area may be revitalized because tourism provides new markets, such as the souvenir trade, for example. So instead of these traditional skills being lost, local people are encouraged to develop them. There may also be more long-lasting changes, which actually lead to the empowerment of both groups and individuals in the host area. For example, tourism creates openings for employment for women, and through giving them a chance to have a personal income, it allows them to become more independent. In addition, because tourism tends to work through a very few languages that have worldwide usage, those working in the tourist industry may be encouraged to acquire new languages, and this will empower them through providing wider access. To globalize media, and improving their job prospects in a wider context. Right, now we'll take a short break there, and then we'll look at a couple of case studies, and see how far the points we've discussed so far apply to them. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now it turns to part four. Part four. Listen to part of a lecture that an architect is giving about the Millennium Dome. Read the summary below before you listen. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Ask why the Millennium Dome is so unpopular. Why people are so upset by it? After all, there are ugly buildings all over the world. Blocks of flats and office blocks in every city in the world are truly unpleasant to look at. I'm sure you have plenty of ugly buildings in your city. However, the important difference is that the Millennium Dome was not constructed quickly and cheaply like some 1950s block of flats. It was built to celebrate a special occasion. It took years of planning and years of construction. And it cost an enormous amount of money, not far off a billion pounds. The Millennium Dome is supposed to be beautiful. It is, however, quite horrible. It was built to bring one of the world's great cities into the twenty-first century. Now, less than ten years later, nobody wants to look at it. I am afraid that it will always be famous for its ugliness. In the United States, we have our ugly buildings too. The Chicago Public Library is a good example, and the Experience Project Museum in Seattle is awful. But there is something about the Millennium Dome that makes it worse, in my opinion, at least. I admit that the design of the building is ambitious and, of course, is a great achievement of engineering. However, I'm afraid that for me that is not enough. To my mind, the Millennium Dome was and is a huge disappointment. So, what will become of the building now? I understand that it has been bought by a company that hoped to turn it into a venue for entertainment events like shows and concerts. I suppose that, considering how much it cost, it is good that it will be used for something. Personally, however, I would prefer to see it pulled down. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.